In the second episode of our workshop series in Philippine Institutions 100, we will discuss the early political institutions and social stratification present in the islands of the Philippines before the arrival of the Spaniards in the 16th century, and the changes that took place as the colonizers introduced various political, economic, and cultural institutions in which some of them are still present until today. This is the nature of the colonized. The Philippines the Philippines, a tropical and maritime country in Southeast Asia, has a land surface area of 114,830 square statute miles and is specifically located at 13 degrees north and 122 degrees east near the equator. It is bounded by the Pacific Ocean to the east, South China Sea to the west, and the Celebes Sea to the south. It is a part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, the world's greatest earthquake belt. The archipelagic state is made up of more than 7,107 islands and islands, grouped within three major islands, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. The complex shape of the Philippine Islands gives the country an exceptionally long coastline, fine harbors, and landlocked straits. Its access to the sea allows the Philippines to link with other Southeast Asian countries, and the intertwining of land and sea promotes population settlement, urbanization, and economic activities. Its diverse coastal zone consists of a variety of tropical ecosystems, including sandy beaches, rocky headlands, sand dunes, coral reefs, mangroves, seagrass beds, wetlands, estuaries, and lagoons. Other prominent physiographic features of the country are lakes and rivers, peninsulas, inter-island seas, mountain systems, volcanoes, and plains. The country is very rich in natural resources, both metallic and non-metallic reserves. The Encounter of the Philippines with Spain Spain's search for a western route to the Moluccas to look for spices led Ferdinand Magellan and his crew into contact with the inhabitants of the Homonhon Island instead, which is later known as part of the Philippines. The existing trade with Chinese and Indian merchants and the rich natural resources motivated the Spaniards to settle in the Philippines. The Spanish colonizers made the country their stepping stone to establish their presence in Asia, promote commercial trade, and propagate the tenets of Christianity in the area. Balangay, the immediate Philippine society upon Spanish contact. According to Scott 1994, Balangay or Barangay was among the first native words that the Spaniards learned from the Philippines, which was used to call the early independent settlements in the archipelago. The Balangay is small in size and is constituted by about 30 to 50 families. It is a distinctive geographic locale, regularly near the coast or reverend. The Balangay is dependent on the monsoon weather, particularly the northern lice and the southern lice. Its population is sustained via a subsistence economy. The community norm is adaptive to an idyllic lifestyle where the workplace and rest place is just one place. The four pillars of the Philippines' ancient political structure and culture are the Datu, Babaylan, Bagani, and Panday. The Datu referred to the chief or lord of vassals, holding the highest position in the Balangay. Juan de Placencia described that the Datus were chiefs of but a few people, and that when the Malayus came to the land, the head of Barangay was taken for a Datu. The Datu's authority arose from his lineage, while his power depended upon his wealth, number of subjects and slaves, and reputation for physical prowess. The Datu is expected to govern his people, settle disputes, protect them from enemies, and lead them in battle, and in return, receive labor and tribute from his people. He was the executive, the legislator, the judge, and the supreme commander in time of war. 
The Babaylan referred to the shamans or spirit mediums in the pre-colonial Philippines. They hold a powerful position in pre-colonial barangay due to their great kinaadman or wisdom and healing prowess. They perform the Pag-Anito rituals which were crucial to community affairs. The Pag-Anito are conducted by offering food, wine, pigs, and gold, and the Babaylan chants her song to communicate with spirits and ask for fertility of lands, newlyweds, or domestic animals, for rain or fair weather, for victory in war or plunder in raids, recovery from illness or the control of epidemics, or the placating of the souls of the deceased. The Babaylan could be either male or female, or male transvestites called asog, but most were commonly women. They came to recalling through attacks of illnesses or insanity, which could only be cured by accepting the call and attach themselves as apprentices or alabay to some older Babaylan, frequently a relative. Bagani referred to warrior leaders that defended the community from external threats. They fought alongside the Datu in battles and rode and manned his warship. In the Visayas, warriors gained Datus as a symbol for their bravery and victories in war or plunder in raids. Blacksmiths Panday sa Puthaw, goldsmiths Panday sa Bulawan, master carpenters, and boat builders were called Panday in pre-colonial times. They exercised effective control over the barangay's means of production. Being a panday sa puthaw in particular was considered to be the noblest profession as it was the most profitable since only the wealthiest datus had the means to import the raw material. They manufactured, repaired, or retempered tools and weapons like the bolo. A panday usually has an apprentice called masao who mans the furnace. The social stratification of ancient Philippine society is composed of three classes, the Datu, Timawa or Maharlika, and the Uripun class. The Uripun is further divided into two, the Namamahay and the Sagigilid. The La Isla 1565 described the Datu class as the chiefest. The Datu class specifically guarded their lineage. Thus, they married within their ranks either at home or abroad or limited their offspring through birth control. Those in the Datu class possessed heirloom wealth called Bahandi, which is required for status display, exchange in marriages, and collateral for loans among others. The Timawa class or Maharlika in Central Luzon is constituted of people defined in Spanish dictionaries as freemen, libres, or freedmen. Libertos. Scott 1994 cited the La Isla 1565 who referred to the Timawa as a privileged class. They were originally offsprings or descendants of Adatu's commoner wives or slave concubines. Slaves could also be freed, Mati Timawa, and all persons liberated by their own masters were called Ginoo. Those of the Timawa class paid tribute or buhis, but those attached to their lord as personal vassals paid no tribute and rendered no agricultural labor. In the Boxer Codex, they were referred to as knights and hidalgos. The Uripun is a class that was constituted of slaves, but sociologically, they are what they call commoners in contemporary European society. Individual status within the Uripun class depended on birthright, inherited or acquired debt, commuted penal sentence, or victimization by the more powerful. The Uripun were legally slaves. They could be bought and sold as laborers and even as human sacrifices. The market for these exchanges thrived due to the shortage of labor. Debt slavery was also prevalent because of the undeveloped agriculture, limited goods, and high interest rates, which resulted in debtors only having little collateral except for their own persons. Like Datus and Timawa, the Uripun bore children of their same class. In the case of mixed marriages, their children became half or quarter slaves who served their masters half time or quarter time. The Aliping Namamahay or serfs was part of the Uripun class. 
they came into their condition in three ways. Inheritance from namamahay parents, dropping down from timawa status, or rising up from sagigilid. The namamahay owned a house and supported themselves while serving their master during planting and harvest seasons, rode for him, helped in the construction of his house, and served his visitors. With opportunity and enterprise, they could earn enough to decrease their debt or even pay it off in full. The Aliping Sagigilid are slaves who were at the bottom of the Uripun social scale. Luwarka 1582 described them as the most enslaved, the ones mostly sold to the Spaniards. Unlike the Namamahay, the Sagigilid were household dependents. They live in their master's house and receive food and clothing from him. However, they were given one day out of four outside to work for themselves. They can be married off only with their master's consent and assume householding status. Shown is the political and economic class position in the pre-Spanish Eastern Visayas from Cummins and Kushner, 1974. Political institutions introduced upon contact with the Philippines Several political institutions established by the colonial power reflect the Philippines' hierarchical political structure during the colonization of the Spanish. The Philippines was a captaincy general ruled by the Spanish king through the vice royalty of Nueva España or Mexico from 1565 to 1821. The Real y Supremo Consejo de las Indias was created by Charles V in 1524. Its function was to administer all the Spanish possessions. It was the Supreme Court of Appeal to which all cases from colonial audiencias were referred for final decision. It was, however, not only a judicial court of appeal, but also a directive ministry in charge of overseeing the administrative activities of the colonial audiencias and executives. The Council of the Indies was composed of a president, a high chancellor, eight lawyers, a fiscal, two secretaries, and a lieutenant chancellor who are all noble birth and qualified by experience and ability to carry out responsibilities. Prior to the creation of the Audiencia de Manila in 1584, the government of the Philippines was subordinate to the Viceroy and Audiencia in Mexico. However, several factors including the time required to transfer document and correspondence, the scarcity of ships available for the travel between the Philippines and New Spain, and the inadequate communication channels hampered the performance of the colony in general. Different individuals, such as Governor Ronquillo de Peñalosa and Captain Gabriel de Rivera, demanded and influenced the request of a separate audiencia in Manila with the same powers and functions as the audiencias of the other colonies. On May 5, 1583, Philip II issued a proclamation establishing the audiencia de Manila. The Governor General presided over both general and administrative matters and his authority was final except in cases of litigation that could be appealed to the Audiencia of Mexico. The Governor General is the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. He was also the head of the Real Audiencia and as Vice Real Patron, he had influence over ecclesiastical appointments in the Church such as overseeing mission work. The Governor General was the source of the civil power for the various levels of administration. The Audiencia was first and always a court of justice. It was established to try cases and settle disputes, to prevent royal officials from abusing their power, two ancient Castilian institutions, the Residencia and the Visita, were established in the Philippines. In addition, the Oidores are tasked to try limited cases and also conduct inspections in provinces and jails. The Residencia was first used in the Indies in 1501. It was a public judicial review of a residenciado by the West de Residencia conducted at the end of his term of office. Heavy fines, property seizure, jail, or a combination of all three punishments were imposed on a residenciado found guilty of public wrongdoing. The residential lasted until 1799 when it was officially abolished throughout the colonies. The visita was distinct from residencia as it is carried out discreetly by a visitador general deployed from Spain and it may occur at any time during the official's term with no prior notice. Visitas might be specific or general. 
A specific visita is an inquiry of a single official or province, while a general visita was an investigation of the entire vice royalty or captaincy general. The visita, which was first used in the Indies in 1499, had the same goals as the residential, which, which is to assure faithful and effective service by government officials. Wrongdoers were either penalized, dismissed from office, or ejected from the colony, or a combination of all three. In the Ogentias, the Oidores were allowed to hear civil cases, but in Ogentias, where there were no alcaldes del crimen, the Oidores were allowed to try both civil and criminal cases. The decisions of the cases tried by the Oidores must be signed by the President and the Magistrates. The President of the Council of the Indies assigns inspection visits across the provinces to Oidores, who are also expected to inspect the colony's jails on a weekly basis. The Alcalde Mayor governs pacified provinces or alcaldias. Their functions are as follows. Supervise the tax collection from Crown Encomiendas, inspect encomiendas, serve as judge, chief of police, vice regal patron, and governor captain of the province, responsible only to the governor general and the Real Audiencia in Manila. Engage in trade through indulto de comercio, here, the Alcalde Mayor acts as a comerciante, extorting money from the Filipinos through money lending practices. Because of this, the Alcalde Mayor earned more than his annual salary, ranging from 1,500 to 1,600. The Corredor General governs the Corremento or Unpacified Military Provinces. Both the Alcalde Mayor and the Corredor General perform the same function and exercise administrative, judicial, and military authority. The pueblos or towns were headed by the gobernador Silio, which is likewise the highest position open to Filipinos in the civil government. The following are the qualifications for the gobernador Silio. Filipino or mestizo, 25 years old, literate in oral or written Spanish, had been a cabeza de barangay for four years. The gobernador Silio performs administrative duties such as preparation of the padron or tribute list, collection of the tributes, tally the tributes with outdated census estimates, recruitment and distribution of men for the craft labor, communal public works such as construction and repair of minus bridges and the quinto or military conscription, responsible for paying the maintenance of the municipal guards in the jail, feeding the prisoners, and supplying the municipal government with personnel and supplies, serve as postal clerk, Judge in civil suits, such as cases on lands, justice, finance, and the armed forces. However, with all these administrative functions, the gobernador Silio is paid nearly 24 pesos annually, a stark contrast to the excessive salary of 1,500 to 1,600 or more through the indulto de comercio of the alcalde mayor. Failure to also deliver the required total of the tributes would lead to the punishment such as paying fine or imprisonment of the gobernador Silio. Nevertheless, the gobernador Silio abuses his power by confiscating the wages of polo laborers and utilizing their labor for his personal interest. They are also exempted from paying tributes and from rendering forced labor. The social unit of the pre-colonial Philippine society, the barangay, was incorporated into the oppressive and exploitative institutions established by the Spanish colonizers through reduction. In this case, the barangay transformed into a political unit through the construction of churches and private homes, as well as through the introduction of foreign cultural elements. The barangays were headed by the Cabeza de Barangay, who were mainly tasked with collecting tribute for the gobernador Silio. Their role was also to maintain peace and order within the barangay, as well as recruit pulistas or laborers for communal public works. Similar to the gobernador Silio, the Cabezas were also exempted from paying tribute and forced labor. Who is qualified to be a Cabeza de Barangay? He must be literate in Spanish, has good moral character, and owns property. This is an illustration of the political administration in the Philippines under Spain. Economic institutions introduced by Spain upon contact with the Philippines.
According to Anderson, the encomienda system, which had its origins in Reconquista, Spain, aimed to balance the demands for labor with Indian justice by rewarding the serving crown workers in the colonies. It doesn't take a remarkable skill for observation or argumentation to understand that these multiple purposes were fundamentally at odds with one another in areas where there was a pressing demand for native labor and ineffective or unpopular native protection measures. Encomienda was little distinguishable from Repartimento when it first emerged in the American colonies shortly after permanent Spanish settlement. Both were initially illegitimate techniques for obtaining labor from contacted native populations, as well as some local native production and alluvial gold. The Repartimento continued to be a somewhat erratic system that was very variable depending on local conditions. But the Encomienda always took the shape that would define it throughout Spain's colonial endeavors over the following century. The encomienda continued to exist in the Philippines up until the middle of the 17th century. The situation remained the same with the exception that in the second part of the century, there were somewhat more royal gifts than private grants. Encomienda survived in the Philippines in large part because of the colony's frontier status. Following Dutch, English, Muslim, Malay, and Chinese attacks in the Philippines, successive Spanish kings permitted encomiendas to endure as lucrative land holdings. Although encomenderos in the Philippines would never attain the prestige and political authority that they had in the Americas, encomienda grew in the colony under these favorable conditions for the crown and wasn't decisively challenged until the second part of the 7th century, when the military situation in the area rendered the tactical value of the system obsolete. The earliest and most significant system in the Spanish Philippines for arranging Filipino society and labor for 50 years was the encomienda, and in most other islands besides Luzon, Encomenderos were in the forefront of Spanish colonization and the organization was a significant source of both crown revenue and knowledge about indigenous peoples. Encomienda is one of the few reliable sources of information for early Philippine colonial history because it was formed as early as 1752 or rather 1572 and did not start to deteriorate for another century. So overall, an encomienda is a grant of authority over the inhabitants of a particular territory, granting the encomendero the ability to demand specific labor services and to collect for himself the tribute due to the king. It was a royal grant of a particular location or community's tributes as a pension to a deserving subject, imposing on him the duty to offer material and spiritual supports to its residents. Moreover, the encomienda was given to an honorable individual in acknowledgement of their own and their ancestors' outstanding actions and services to the monarch, either directly by the king in Madrid or by the governor general in Manila. Usually, the donation was intended to last for two lifetimes, but in 1619, at the request of the people of Manila, who were backed by the governor general and the archbishop, the monarch extended it to three generations. The king didn't extend his regal favor to all the Spanish colonies until 17 years later, yet it appears that he changed the duration to two lifetimes in 1648. As for the types of encomiendas, two kinds existed in the Philippines. The royal or crown encomienda, which is also called encomienda de la real corona, and the private encomienda, also called encomienda de particulares. The former were lands reserved for the crown and included the principal towns and ports like Bagumbayan, now Luneta, Lagyo, which is approximately the site of the present Plaza Militar between Malate and Ormita, Santa Ana di Sapa, Tundo, Navotas, and Malabon in Manila, and Lubao and Betis in Pampanga. The private encomiendas were granted to individuals who were either the king's prodigies or men who served with merit during the conquest and pacification campaigns. Examples of these were Pandacan, Sampaloc, and Makabibe, privately owned by Juan Pedro de Chavez, Bataan by Juan Isguera, and Batangas owned personally by Francisco Rodriguez. And because the Spanish colony continues to expand, the digest of laws issued by the King of Castilla in his capacity as the Lord of the Indies was promulgated to unite the Indies into the Crown of Castilla. The set of laws is called the Recopilacion de Leyes de los Reinos de las Islas de Indias. Now, Rialengas, or crown grounds, pertains to the entire vast empire that became part of the king's domain by legitimate decree. The king granted royal grants to notable conquistadors, the church, friar orders, and other religious organizations using Rialengas to divide territory among the native population. On the other hand, the lands assigned to the natives are called the Pueblo lands, and the tracts awarded by royal grants are referred to as Hacendas. To simplify terms, we retain the word Rialengas to refer to the remainder of the land. 
with the Mercedes or favors from the king or Asufukchari lands, these are the result of Pueblo lands not being demarcated. Since all lands belong to the king, occupants do not carry land titles with the parcels they are occupying. The same applies to meats and haciendas. As such, these lands were essentially favors from the king. In both situations, the lack of cadastering left the Pueblo lands open to future land grabbing or usurpation and by extension made it simple to expand the haciendas illegally. So the absence of a land tax was a corollary to the fundamental idea and it persisted until the end of the Spanish era. As for the polo y servicios, this refers to the compulsory 40-day forced labor of Pueblo men. The men are forcibly demanded to work in a span of 40 days which is often stretched into months or more. The Tributos Reales or tributes exacted from natives to cover the costs of colonization and in recognition of their vassalage to the King of Spain. As a direct tax, this was levied on all Filipino adults. Some exemptions include the incumbent gobernador Silios and Cabezas as well as their families, government employees, soldiers with distinguished service, descendants of Filipino chiefly class who served in the pacification campaigns conducted by the conquistadores, choir members, sacristanes, porters of the churches, as well as government witnesses. Originally, the tributo reales had the amount of 10 reales, 8 of which are the tribute proper, and the remaining 2 reales going to the Situado de la Cobranza, which rose to 12 reales in 1851, then to 15 reales by 1874. By 1851, every unmarried male over 18 and every unmarried female over 20 living with their parents had to pay taxes, although initially it was for every unmarried male over 20 and every unmarried female over 25. Tributes could be paid in cash or in kind, party or holy, as palay, tobacco, chickens, textiles, cotton, wax, or special regional produce with a fixed price placed on each item. The Compras Reales, also known as Bandala, was another exploitative mechanism by the Spanish colonizers implemented by Governor Sebastián Hurtado del Corcuera in the early part of the 17th century. The word Bandala came from the Tagalog word Mandala, which is a round stack of rice stalks to be threshed. This is an indirect tax that refers to the annual government purchase of provisions required from Pueblo families. Provincial quotas were subdivided among the towns. Farmers were essentially robbed or had their products confiscated because all they got in return were promissory notes which were seldom redeemed in full. Moreover, because the government set prices that were lower than the actual price of the products, farmers who cannot fill the quota on their own end up buying at a higher price from others to sell at a lower rate to the government. The Inquilinato system was a land system wherein agricultural estates were leased out. So tenants were called inquilinos or cash tenants, but they do not till the land as the inquilinos had subtenants who cultivate the land and were called kasama. So estate owners collected a fixed rent from inquilinos and these were deducted from the crop and what remains of the harvest is then divided between the inquilinos and the kasama. So basically, the kasama is exploited as he does all the labor, while the tenant and the landowner enjoy the benefits. Meanwhile, the sanlang bili comes from the word sangla or mortgage and bili or sale. This governs the mortgage system or the pacto de retroventa or pacto de retro for short, which was a contract under which the borrower conveyed his land to the lender with the proviso that he could repurchase it for the same amount of money that he had received. Essentially, this is a legalized land grabbing. The borrower usually became the tenant of the lender because borrowers rarely get to buy their lands back while the landlord got the land cheap because the money loan is usually between one-third and one-half the land's true value. Unlike the parcels in the Pueblo lands, haciendas granted during the era of conquest were extensive tracts and legally titled. So how was the system introduced in the Philippines? Conquistadors given land grants usually had no family or heirs, or left the colony or died in the wars. Many of these estates fell into the hands of the church, friar orders, or other similar organizations through the original landowners' last wills and testaments. 
The Philippines experienced a growth and capitalist linkage with the world, and improvement in technology made agriculture more profitable. So demand for agricultural products expanded, leading to increased demand for land and its cultivation. And so, land originally assigned to religious orders and Spaniards are the encomiendas, but at that time, there were still not much financially rewarding markets for surplus produce, so the encomenderos had no interest in increasing agricultural production beyond what they needed. Natives eventually lost more land to the friar haciendas through land grabbing, usurpation, and fraudulent surveys. The Manila Galleon normally made a yearly voyage to Acapulco. Initially, it, although it was the main economic activity of the colony, it had practically no impact on the native economy because Manila was merely a transshipment port through which Chinese goods were shipped to Mexico and Mexican silver flowed to the Chinese coast. In fact, in Mexico, the Manila Galleon was known as now the China. This mainly benefited the Spanish governor, members of the consulado, and Spanish residents who were residing in Manila. The galleon trade operated for 250 years from 1565 to 1815. The Patronato Real signifies the relation between the church and the Spanish crown. This refers to the control over ecclesiastical matters. So every priest who went to the Indies had to have royal permission. As a patron, the monarch also had veto power over the promulgation of papal bulls and exercised through his viceroy's close supervision over the ecclesiastics and the dominions. He also had the right to nominate bishops and priests. The patronato real conferred to the Spanish crown thus enabled kings to control any communications between the popes and the churches of their domains in the Indies. On the other hand, the obvious pias, which literally means pious works, is a charitable institution slash first organized credit institution in the Philippines run by the church. The Galen trade provided most of the funds which were used for charity works, religious activities, and other public benefits. Others were donated by rich individuals in society to the various religious orders. Parochial and visita schools in particular operated using the money from the obvious pias. Cultural Institutions Introduced by Spain Upon Contact with the Philippines The Spanish colonizers introduced not only foreign political and economic institutions to the Philippines but also cultural ones such as churches, schools, and settlements. However, these cultural institutions introduced by Spain displaced the natives from their communities and sources of living, commonly in coastal areas and riverines. The Spanish friars specifically transformed the natives' consciousness and status in the guise of being civilized and regarded their culture as works of the devil. The Reducciones is the forced resettlement of Filipinos by the friars to consolidate masses for conversion and taxation. The natives were brought to live near the municipal centers or poblacion within the hearing distance of the church bells, the Bajo de las Campanas. The friars used a variety of techniques to gain native assent to resettlement. Some offered gifts in the form of free housing to the people. The government also enticed the chiefs with titles and honors. From small scattered communities, the Philippines landscape transformed into large villages, paving the way for the formation of the Poblacion Cabisera Visita complexes. The Cabisera complex is the principal centralized population center surrounded by subordinate villages or barrios and still smaller communities called sitios. Within the Cabisera, there's the church, schools for both boys and girls, a mercado, and a structure for government. The church was the nucleus of each settlement complex, and the community in which it was located was called the Cabisera, also known as the heart of the Poblacion, hence the Poblacion Barrio Sitio system. The Visita is a small settlement consisting of a chapel without a resident priest. It is supposed to periodically visited by a priest from the Cabisera. The term Visita is also used as the equivalent of the Spanish term Visitacion. However, visitation refers to inspection or correction. The bishop is responsible for this process which is to be done regularly in all the parishes of the diocese. Additionally, 
This is also used to describe a similar visit that religious order provincials make to every one of their subjects or religious homes. Similar to extraordinary inspections, whether by ecclesiastical or civil authorities in a specific situation requiring urgent care. Due to the concept of visita, the traditional practice of visita iglesia was born during the rise of Christian faith in the Philippines during the Spanish era. Believers would then visit parishes as a symbol of their faith and penance as what Christ had done as he marched to his death. The Iglesia Católica or the Catholic Church was the nucleus of each settlement complex. It was found within the Cabecera. In accordance with Spain's objectives to expand the colony and indoctrinate the pre-colonial Filipinos, visitas were built in each pueblo and such were visited by Catholic priests to preach the Word of God. This practice has been carried out to the contemporary Philippines as the Visita Iglesia, wherein devotees visit seven churches to show penance and faith. Escuelas del Pueblos de Ambos Sexos During the Spanish colonization, the Philippines had significant educational transformations, most notably through the enactment of policies that were in accordance with the directives of the Spanish crown. For example, Agoncillo stated that, in accordance with Charles V's proclamation of July 17, 1550, the Spaniards created the La Letran con Sangre Entra, one of the earliest schools in the Philippines with the objective of teaching the Indios their language for their mission of having brilliant Christianity. In light of this, various institutions, for example, the Colegio de Niños, the Colegio de Manila, were established to prepare the sons of the natives for governmental duties, particularly as future Gobernador Silios and Cabezas de Barangay. Additionally, the Spanish missionaries particularly established separate schools for boys and girls. Some of the institutions solely for Spanish boys include the Colegio Maximo de San Ignacio, the College of San Ildefonso, later renamed the University of San Carlos, and the College of San Jose. As part of its curriculum, these institutions taught the students philosophy, canon and civil law, rhetoric, and Latin. The Spaniards also founded schools for poor boys, like the Escuela Pia, which later became the Ateneo de Manila University. On the other hand, schools exclusively for girls include the Colegios of Santa Potenciana, Santa Isabel, and the Immaculada Concepcion Concordia. There are also Colegios exclusive for the daughters of upper-class Spaniards known as Beaterios, like the Beaterio de la Compañía de, de Jesús, Santa Catalina de Sena, San Sebastián de Calumpang, Santa Rita de Pasig, and Santa Rosa. Furthermore, some institutions like the University of Santo Tomas, formerly known as the Colegios de Nuestra Señora del Santísimo Rosario, offered tertiary education for both boys and girls. Agoncillo 1990 also stated that the Educational Decree of 1863 established a free compulsory publicly supported system of primary schools along with the formation of a men's normal school. Therefore, every town had at least two schools, one for girls and one for boys, ranging in age from 6 to 14. Christian doctrine, moral, sacred history, general geography, and Spanish history, agriculture, rules of courtesy, vocal music, and the Spanish language were among the subjects covered. However, the girls are enrolled to sewing classes instead of agriculture, geography, and Spanish history. The following are the learning or instruction materials commonly used during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines. La Cartilla the La Cartilla is a primer or book for children, particularly for grade school students. It is the manual of learning and teaching the Castilian alphabets. Schmacher 1979 stated that this was one of the things procured and solicited by the parish priest in order to overcome the challenges of maintaining schools. La Castellana 
The Castellana is the Spanish language which was taught to the students. It is one of the subjects included in the curriculum during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines. The subject focuses primarily on teaching students how to read and write using Castilian language as well as studying the principles of its grammar. La Doctrina Cristiana In 1593, the Dominicans wrote the first catechism for their evangelization called Doctrina Cristiana. It was printed in wooden blocks in Spanish, translated into Roman letters, and Tagalog in the Tagalog characters of the syllabary. The book contains the principal prayers, basic truths, and Christianity's moral precepts, which were supposed to be memorized prior to baptism. Christian doctrine was considered one of the subjects taught to children, which focuses on the studying of religion and sacred history.